So my name is Cheryl Tenasco White Duck. I work with the First Nations uh, Health and Labrador of Quebec uh, Commission. And uh, these workshops are brought to you in partnership by First Nations Education Council and First Nations Health and Social Service Commission. So with that, I am your advisor at FNQL HSSC for those who are in the agreement with us. And I would like to introduce to you Eva de Godstein, and I'll let you take it from there, Eva. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Lena Cluxton and Valérie Fortin. So Valérie, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself briefly. Yeah, I could. So hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and being part of that program growing together where it's we're all together for our children. So it's such a dream coming true to be there with you. And I'm working at FNEC. I'm a SPECED uh, counselor. So I'm the one you can write any times if you do have question about the program and if you have some needs. So I'm the one who answers to you. So don't do not hesitate. You can write to me anytime. And also um, I will pass it on to, to Eva or Lena. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Valérie. Um, so I'm uh, Eva de Gostini. I'm a uh, child psychologist and I've been working um, in the field for many, many years. My, my specialty is with slightly older children and that is why I have with me my colleague uh, Lena Cluxton from the Newfeld Institute. We are both with the Newfeld Institute and uh, we are hoping to share with you and to help you to get another way of looking at the young children in your care. Um, we come from a developmental approach, and we'll explain that um, as we go through the material. Um, so, just Lena, do you want to just say a few words, and then I think there'll be a moment later on as well where you can introduce yes. yourself a little bit more as well. Thank you so much, Eva. A pleasure and honor to be here with you. I live in Maine, um, which is um, currently in extreme cold. And uh, so if you see me moving around a little bit, it's because I have a nice little electric heater that I'm keeping right by me. Um, my background is in early childhood education as well as developmental psychology. And I have some years of experience. I'll say more about my years of experience in, in a few moments, but welcome everyone. Wonderful to see you. Yeah. So I'll just share my screen here and um, oops get us to the beginning of our presentation. And there we are. So we're in session two. And today we're going to look more deeply into the personality traits of young children, our little ones from birth to four, who are the children that are in your care. Um, we'll basically uh, do um, about a 45, well, about an hour, a bit of long, a bit of an hour presentation where we're going to go into really more depth looking at who these children are, what they bring to us, um, and then we'll take a break. Uh, after that, we'll, um, we'll go back and we'll just finish off by looking at some of the things that, that you can do in your practice. Uh, we don't tell you recipes, we don't tell you strategies what to do, we just give you ideas of what the children need and how you can best respond to those needs. And then we will have time for, uh, for reflection and questions um, and, and some closing words. Um, so I will just pass it on to Lena again. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Eva. Um, so as I mentioned, I've worked in various ways uh, with young children all my life. I am a mother um, of two children and one stepson. Uh, that was the turning point for me in beginning to really strive to understand young children in a, in a different way was when I had my daughter 30 some years ago. Um, lately, uh, most recently, I worked at Bowdoin College Children's Center. There's pictures of my classroom and some of the children who were in my care. Um, and we became, uh, through my interest, we became a Newfeld informed center. A lot of the pictures that you're going to see. Um, are from this center. 
And some of the pictures in this presentation are also from First Nations community. All of these are just serving to show illustration of the theory and to provide perhaps a bit of a story as to what is going on and why we are looking at this in the way we're looking at. There's, we are different cultures, um, but there's a huge bridge between our cultures and that is the united love of children that we have. So thank you for coming to these sessions. Look forward to your feedback and comments and questions. With that, I'll pass it back to you, Eva. Yes. Oh, actually, I'm not yes. passing it back to you. <laughs> Sorry there. Um, so one of the one of the first principles that we talked about in session one, and we will constantly be talking about it, is that nature has a plan. This is Dr. Neufeld's uh, phrase. And um, every time we begin these presentations, we're going to look through the season that we are currently in. This is in a way, a model of what development is about. It's wholeness, it has seasons, it's reliable, um, and all growth has a season. So what we're doing today is to really look at growth of the young child through a developmental lens, which means that it's a, it's not separating things out. It's trying to take in a whole picture. Now in fall, I talked a little bit about how in fall, the ski, nature scatters seeds with wild abandonment. And um, that every seed has a different quality to it. And I think of this as sort of uh, an, a metaphor for our children. Um, and the cycle of maturation going through the seasons and it's reliable, it happens every year. So fall is when we're scattering those seeds and what is winter? Um, winter is a time of waiting and we're waiting for the return of the sun. It's a time of rest. And it's also a cold time and a beautiful time and the warmth that we find is from our hearts, from within, and with our community upon whom we are quite dependent uh, in this season. I want to um, share with you a little bit of writing from one of my teachers, Parker Palmer. Winter. The rigors of winter are accompanied by amazing gifts. One gift is beauty. Another gift is the reminder that times of dormancy and deep rest are essential to all living things. Despite all appearances, of course, nature is not dead in winter. It has gone underground to renew itself and prepare for spring. Winter is a time when we are admonished and even inclined to do the same ourselves. Then we discover once again that the cycle of the seasons is trustworthy and life-giving, even in the most dismaying season of all. So this is the um, season that has its teaching. This is part of the teaching of winter. Thank you, Lena. The, um, and I, I think that's really so much of what it is that we want to bring to you not necessarily something that is new because we know that uh, that that many of what we are sharing is also part of the teachings of your communities and of your culture um, but we have a, the fortunate the fortune to be guided by a man his name is dr gordon newfeld who has been able to pull together a vast vast array of information uh, to help us to understand um, human nature human beings as we are and so we're, what we are presenting to you is based on the work that he has done, a massive work of his entire lifetime. And uh, both Lena and I feel honored to be able to share this with you. 
because um, for both of us, and certainly I speak for myself, this has changed the way in which I relate to my family uh, in the work that I do in schools, especially with children who have uh, challenges with their behavior, um, with understanding uh, when a behavior that might be challenging to me as an adult is not really a challenging behavior at all. And we covered that a little bit in session one. So hopefully many of you either attended session one or had a chance to listen to the recording, or maybe you want to go back and listen to the recording again. And so what we've pulled from session one are just some of the key concepts and phrases. And um, what we're hoping is that one or other of these will be something that will stick with you. And maybe in a moment when you're wondering what you should be doing or when you are um, with a child, that maybe this phrase will come to you and guide you in your interaction uh, with that particular child. Eva, can I add something to this? Um, that when we're talking about these phrases, I found in my experience, this is these phrases are what popped into my mind as guides to me when I was in a situation where it was possible my heart would become hardened or that I would act in a way that, that I wouldn't um, necessarily feel was in keeping with what I know to be the best interests of the child. And so they're guides that, that I found useful um, in my work. That, and it was always interesting to me how one would pop into my mind. And I wasn't asking for it, uh, but there it was because they are so succinct and they're lovely guides. This is not meant to be an inclusive list. You will add to it yourselves. Maybe these won't speak to you, others may. Yes, and we're going to pull together a list like this for each of the sessions, and then we'll make them available to you in, in a form that you can refer to as well. Um, this is a program that is uh, very new in its inception. Uh, we're, we're developing uh, materials and guides and support to you, both in terms of what we think you might need, but also feedback uh, to us in terms of what you would like for, for us to do, uh, to, to share with you, to guide you, because the this program is really about meeting um, meeting the emotional needs of the very youngest of the children in your care, uh, in our society, uh, the very precious ones. And, um, and when, we, when we meet their emotional needs, we're going to then meet their developmental needs, and we're going to be able to respond to all that they need in terms of growing. So our focus is going to be primarily on trying to create the conditions in which our children feel the most welcome. So the last, uh, in the last session, we, we concluded, and we'll keep saying this as well, because boy, when you're in the middle of some of the uh, situations that you find yourself in, it's hard to believe that nature has a plan. And we're going to look at that today. We're going to explain to you why some of those odd behaviors happen, but there's a plan there. And then how we see influences what we do, as, as Lynn is saying, when that thought came to her, when that particular sentence came to her, she was able to see what was happening in front of her in a different way. And when we see it differently, we actually respond differently. It, it takes a little while, but sometimes it starts to become much more natural. All through this course, we're going to be focusing on what's the most important thing to us as human beings, which is attachment, and what it is that worries us the most, which is separation. And of course, each child is constantly wondering who is taking care of me. And they are so fortunate because they have a large, wonderful community of people that come up, wake up every morning and go into the centers and are there to take care of children, even under the most difficult circumstances. But sometimes what's in our heart, the child doesn't always experience in the way that we mean to. So we're going to talk about ways in which we can answer that question more clearly for children. We remember that they can only have one thought at a time, and we'll look at that more today. It can be quite a tripping point for most of us. The pace of childhood is slow. It is really important for us to remember. It takes time. And we also want to make sure that we find ways of being the answer. And I would just add to that as well, Eva, that last time we looked at um, 
some of the ways to be in, in the answer for attachment is through matchmaking and, and bridging and creating a village of attachment. And that, these things will come up over and over again. This last session was a bit of an introduction to that. We'll go into it in more depth um, throughout these eight sessions. Yes, and so attachment, it's, we have to remember that as human beings, we are wired for attachment, that we have a need to be together, uh, that we pursue that, that we want that. And of course, again, so much, um, so much of why you are in the jobs that you're in is because you know about that need and you're willing to respond to that need. Um, when we talk about attachment, we talk about the primary relationships, but we also talk about the community that cares for a child. And it's very, very important. But this is something that we are that is so essential to us as human beings. Um, and that is why, again, over and over again, we're going to talk about how our practice and how our interaction with children can keep reassuring them and meet this most fundamental need. So today we're going to keep focusing on who these little ones are. And we know that. We know that they're curious and that they're joyful and that they're absolutely delightful. <laughs> And, uh, and so they, that makes it when they're like that, it is easy to care for them, it is easy to want to care for them. But we also know that they are impulsive. <laughs> they do things that we go, oh my goodness, why did they do that? Um, they, they worry us because of that. Um, there are times when they are very inconsiderate. They really don't think about what, what's happening with other people. Um, they don't, and, and we're going to really look at why this is. And of course, they are very, very needy. But what do we need to understand about their development? Um, I think the, the, the looking at a caterpillar that goes into a cocoon and then comes out as a butterfly is a very apt picture for ourselves. Um, because first of all, the butterfly looks very different than the caterpillar. And we're gonna look at how our little ones are caterpillars where we are the butterflies. And it's sometimes hard to remember why or what it is that they used to be. And then there's the cocoon. There's the space that the caterpillar goes into before it can be transformed. <clears throat> and early childhood is very much that process. And it's a very long process for human beings. The uh, neuroscience tells us that for the brain to fully develop, it takes 25 years. So we aren't exactly like the caterpillar and the cocoon and the butterfly, but, but there is a long, long process before the beautiful butterfly comes about. And we need to understand all of the steps that bring us to that full development, but it takes a long time. And what we're looking at today, um, Eva, I think you would agree, is the part that's taking place, the cocooning that's taking place in these uh, years between birth and really five or six, ultimately, but we're specifically focused on up to age four. Yes, yes. Very, very important years and huge, huge changes that happen. And of course, we all know that because they enter into your, into your centers and uh, many of them cannot walk or talk. And by the time they become four years old, they're pretty good at doing those things. And so that's exactly what we're looking at. So we're going to look right now at the kind of personality characteristics of these young ones. And we have to keep remembering they are not like us. Um, they're very untempered by nature. And, and what do we mean by untempered by nature? Well, first of all, tempering means that something kind of affects something else. It sort of has an impact or an action upon something else to make it somewhat different. And in for our children, um, we know that they have this untempered nat nature because they have a purity and a certainty of emotion. And I think all of you have experienced that. Usually it happens very clearly around two to three years old when children will tell you in no uncertain terms how the world runs or how things are meant to be. They have no shades of gray. Uh, it is either right or it is wrong. I love you or I hate you. Um, <laughs> I want to go now and there is no waiting. It, it, it's, it, there's no, not many shades of gray. Um, you don't hear a little one, even the ones that are most verbal, say, oh, I 
think maybe on the one hand, on the other hand, no, it's very clear. But what's really interesting as well is, of course, they have this incredible ability to believe in magic, uh, to believe that things just happen. And, and that's a wonderful thing. And of course, we've just come through the season of magic, uh, the Christmas season. Um, and it's a very beautiful thing when it happens because it's very pure, it's very certain. But as a result of that, sort of coming together with it, they are also impulsive and unreliable. Um, they know better than they behave. And again, with our little babies, with our little toddlers, with the little ones who, who don't talk very much, we assume that um, they, they need to still develop a lot. But with some of our ones that are starting to become more verbal, they can tell us all the rules. And then a minute later, do the opposite. Because what happens is with them is that they might have a good intention, but that good intention is ex extremely, extremely sort of eclipsed or sidelined by the next impulse. And I don't know, Elaine, if you want to talk a little bit to this picture here. Well, the picture is an illustration of many things, impulse uh, and also um, the uh, belief in magic. Like if we're eating soup or whatever it is we're eating at this moment, then we're going to try it. And of course, it's sand. And uh, there, there they are. Um, and perhaps they've been told not to eat sand, but they can't remember that at the moment that they're um, caught up in the magic of the moment. Yes, I think that's lovely. They get really caught up in the magic. Um, they're also very short-sighted. <laughs> you know, they can't think long-term. Uh, they're terrible at at problem solving and because they can't really look at more than one factor or one thing at a time. And again, I think this little guy here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, there's so many things to say about this picture, but one, I think you can see most of them. There's too many things in her hands and, uh, and yet she's trying this complicated uh, maneuver on, on a board. But what's also important to say at this moment, I think, is that nobody ran in to fix her or teach her a lesson. Um, the, letting this just uh, take place, she'll figure it out um, and without, without adult interference. But that being said, we're also careful with children to stay close in case they become stuck or get into trouble physically. Yeah, and that again, when we talk about the 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 pace the pace of childhood being slow, is that we we understand and know that their desire to solve a problem is bigger than their capacity at this moment in time to do it. So we have to leave some space for that and understand. And of course, again, we uh, <laughs> we many of us learn to be patient and to give that space, but they're just not they're not there yet. Eva, this, just your use of words, just to go back to that for a moment, is um, it seems to me that one of the things on our list should be, although I don't think it is yet, we'll add it in, is giving room. We're, we're, we're going to be talking about giving room to emotion, but here we're also giving room or space, as you use the word, for, for them to figure things out for themselves. Yeah. That's really important at this age. Yeah. Now, there's a whole nother area in which they are not yet like us, um, is that they are very inconsiderate in their relating. Um, and as you know, <laughs> you put a bunch of these little guys together, these little children together, and uh, there are going to be some, some conflicts. <laughs> there are going to be situations in which one child wants to do one thing, like this little one who's sweeping, and the other one is absolutely determined that that's where uh, he or she needs to walk right now. Um, and they, they really, at this point in time, the only perspective they can see is their own perspective. Um, they are, they, what they see is what they, is, is what they experience. Um, they aren't very good at um, noticing the reality that if she's trying to sweep and I'm trying to step, that we're going to get into trouble here because I want to step. And, and again, we're going to explain in a moment why this comes about. Um, they also aren't very diplomatic. Uh, if they don't like your sweater, they're going to tell you. <laughs> they're going to say it flat out. Um, and they also have a, um, a very single-mindedness. 
Um, it's everything is one sided. It's their perspective at this moment in time. Um, it's really about how they see their whole world. And this is so important because this is how they learn who they are because they have this one thought at a time and they have so little they have so little context and experience it becomes very narrow but it's supposed to be yes so we we get a little bit frustrated sometimes with these things um the um they are busy working at something and we need them to switch gears we often call that transitions there's a transition um and yet they are are not paying attention to us they are not they're not switching the gears that we need them to switch because they have this incredible ability to focus um, and again it can be frustrating for us but i think there's two things that we need to to really that that help us to <clears throat> to cope with this or to to have patience with this uh, and one is if we understand what's going on inside of the brain and there's a part of our brain that is absolutely essential to us as human beings. It's called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is a very complex part of our brain, but it is what makes us essentially the, the human beings that we are. But it takes a very, very long time to develop. Uh, well into the mid 20s. So it's it's a very complex part of the brain. Um, as the beings on the planet, um, our youth, our young ones take the longest time to develop because of the complexity of a brain that then of course needs to deal with a very complex world. So for our little ones, this prefrontal cortex, which is actually the part of the brain that lets us consider more than one thought or more than one feeling at a time. It's kind of a bit like a sort of a mixing bowl where things come together, uh, where we can on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, and again, as adults, um, there are, you know, as you go through your day, you're constantly having to make a decision. Um, we're going to talk to you about the emotional needs of the children. Um, and yet, um, when you are looking at your whole group, sometimes you know that this child needs something from you, but the group, on the other hand, the group needs something else. So this ability to really keep things in mind, to look at the whole picture, uh, to consider something else, this is what makes us able to function um, as, as, as capable human beings, especially when, when we are in a caretaking or a caregiving role. But for our young ones, that has not yet started to connect or to develop. It doesn't mean that that part of the brain is not there. It is there, but it hasn't yet started to connect. And so the parts of the brain, so, so what happens is that the brain is still functioning sort of one piece at a time. Um, and this is again part of how development happens. Um, many times, um, well, in the early, early days, children can only actually see out of one eye at a time. And then as they get a little bit older, the two eyes come together and start working together. And so they can see in more depth. And this is how the brain works as well. So they don't have the ability then to mix their thoughts or to mix their feelings. They can only pay attention to one thought at a time. They can only, pre so the, the little guy who is wanting to step up onto that, onto that um, little, um, I don't know what plank. it was there. What was plank. it? Plank, yes, he wants to step out on a plank. He is thinking about stepping up on that plank and he isn't, at that moment, conscious of his little friend who wants to sweep the plank. And the friend who wants to sweep the plank is thinking about sweeping that plank and can't yet think about the fact that maybe somebody else also wants to get onto the plank at that moment. And this is key as to why they are not like us. The, all of this that we're describing, and we'll describe it over and over again, is how they are not like us. This is this I found quite um, a revelation when I first learned it. Yes, yes, because we think that they're being inconsiderate. We think that they're not being kind, and we want to teach them those things, but they but they can't, they can't do that yet because of the way the brain is developing. 
It's similar with emotions. Um, I remember um, this is a slightly older child, but I think this was a child who probably was acting or being like a much younger child um, who in one moment told his teacher that he absolutely loved her and he would do anything for her. And this was just before the recess bell rang and the recess bell rang and then he looked away and she looked away and then she turned back to him and said, now it's time to go into the classroom. And he looked at her and he said, no, it isn't. I hate you. You're stupid. And she looked at me and she said, what did I do wrong? I said, well, now remember, this little guy has had so many problems in his life that he's really much more like one of our young children. He can only have one emotion. When he loves you, he loves you with all his heart. But when you want him to do something that he doesn't want to do, now you are the worst person in the world. Because until the prefrontal cortex gets activated, and it isn't until five to seven years of age, so you aren't dealing with it. many children, you aren't dealing, I think, with any children in your centers who have the capacity to remember that they love you when they dislike you. They can't do that because that prefrontal cortex has not yet gotten activated uh, in that way. So this is the way, again, Eva, I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Is there time for me to say something briefly? Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Um, this, is, this is the dance then that we become engaged with, with the children in. When we start to understand that this is a complete, which we already did know this, but now there's you know all this uh, language that goes along with it. Um, and this is where I began to really dance in a different way with children and have a deeper understanding of what they were up against and love it. I actually, this is the age I love the most, these young ones, because when you talk about mindfulness or being present, there is nobody more present and more mindful than a young child, a two or three-year-old is where it's, it's, even, it's very, very obvious. Yeah, and, this, and you can see that in this picture. This little girl is completely engaged in what she's doing, right? She's just right there with it. Um, and that is, that, is, that is the beauty, and we'll talk in a moment why that is. But of course, it does mean that when they have an impulse, it comes out like that little guy. I love you or I hate you. Whatever it is, it comes out. Um, there's no conflict there. There's no conflict. A slightly older child um, around, you know, again, five to seven years old, and um, you, you often see that uh, around birthday parties, because a four-year-old uh, will start the day as the most wonderful birthday party in the world, and by the end of the day, it's the worst day of their life. <laughs> and you've just planned this very expensive birthday party. And, and some, for some of you, it's you've planned a lovely activity in your center um, with the children. And it's so much fun. And at the beginning, the children love you. And at the end, they're telling you it's the worst day of their life. At five to six years old, they'll, they'll be able at least to say, but it's not the very worst day of my life. They'll remember, but they can't. These kids, one thing at a time, no conflict. It, it, it's right there. What's also interesting here is this does not mean that these children are unkind towards other children. They can be very, very kind towards other children. But what we need to remember is that when they are thinking about somebody else, they can't hold on to themselves. They can't remember what's important to them. And I, again, I, I'm, I'm remembering back to when my own children were very, very little, you know, and uh, and some of their friends are coming over to visit and you talk to them about sharing and of course very hard for children to share because they have to think about the other but if your child decides that they do want to share and they say yes mommy I'm going to share so now they're thinking about the other and when the other child comes and they say here do you want to play with my truck and the other child says yes and then all of a sudden my child burst into tears <laughs> Because when they were thinking about the other child, they really did want to give them the toy. But because of their young age, the minute they gave the toy, all of a sudden, they, they weren't able to think of themselves. So it's, we have to be really sensitive to that, that sometimes they can get themselves into big trouble. Um, and of course, when they're thinking of themselves, they really cannot think of the other child. And so, so many of the conflicts, so many of the problems that we see are related to this incapacity to hold a number of things together at a time, because that prefrontal cortex 
not until five to seven years old. It can't guide them in the way that we just wish that we could do that. Yes. And here we, we see a little a little child. I love this picture. This or that. I mean, he's got his two little cups and he just looks like uh, he's trying to figure out which which one. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we on a different? Oh, here, the different picture. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I switched pictures. Are you here? Yes. OK. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead and talk to this little guy. Oh, okay. So this this little little guy is completely focused on what he's building in in the room. Um, obviously, there aren't any other children around, which makes his task a little bit simpler. We often would leave a child in the classroom by themselves with another adult who was working on prepping lunch or something like that in order to give them an opportunity to play. And um, what we see here is that he is fully engaged with um, his uh, desires of the moment. Um, and he is protected uh, because there aren't any other children that he has to consider. There are no social considerations in this particular moment. And social considerations, um, we, we, asking, we are asking a lot of our children when we understand this stage of their development, um, when we put them into social situations. And so this is one of, the, one of the things we will talk more about, how do we work with the fact that we've put them in situations that maybe are de too demanding um, and too overwhelming for their own emergence. And here, I will show you the next, um, Eva, you can go to the next picture, sorry. <laughs> yeah, did you want, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there we have his, his full emergence in this. He, he has used every movable piece of equipment in the classroom to build this and it is now done. Um, So we, he has the opportunity we see here to be present in the moment with his dominant thought or emotion and no other thoughts or emotion can come in and he's got the space to do it. If there had been, I have watched him and if there were other children um, in the room with him, this often usually happened, they would want to engage with him and this was very overwhelming for him. He liked doing his thing and there he is doing it, becoming more aware of who he is. And we're going to do a, a whole session on play and understanding play and the importance of play. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things that we want to say here in terms of, of the brain development and, and what needs to happen with the brain development is that is that we we sometimes worry when children want to play by themselves. Um, and yet when they are playing by themselves, that is when they get to know who they are the best. And so we need to be aware that um, we, we often talk about um, putting children in social groups so they can learn to get along with each other. But we need to remember that the job of the brain in these early years is to figure out who that child is. Um, if I go back to this slide here, is they need to fully experience each of their emotions. Um, the child, and it's ironic because we, we think, my goodness, that's so rude when a child says, I, I hate you, you're stupid, you're the worst person in the world. I mean, those are all very rude things for, for a child to say, and, and we want to help them find better ways of saying that. But what's important here is that the child is able to live in the moment of not being happy with someone else. When they get older, this will come. They will be able to figure things out. But, but we have to be so careful. And we're, again, as we go through the sessions, we're going to help you to figure out how you can manage things that are not pleasant and that can be upsetting to other people. But we need to respect that, that, that intensity of emotion, the intensity of the love, the intensity of the joy. And again, that's another one of the things I'm sure, Lena, that you notice with the little ones is when they're happy, they're happy with their whole body, right? And that experience is important for emotional development. Yes. Yes. He's doing the heavy lifting of that, of that part of the brain of figuring things out. Yeah. Yeah. And letting anything else interfere. 
Yeah. yeah. So, so they need that purity of thought, that time, that ability to experience um, so that the brain then can kind of say, okay, this is what this is, and this is what this is, and this is what this is. So each of them are kind of developing one by one. And as time goes on, as time goes on, now the brain starts to say, oh, I'm ready to put these things together. But we need to keep remembering that it's not until a child is five years old that that bringing it together is going to happen. So we do need to be the answer, the answer to this brain that is not yet connected together, but that is actually developing in the moment. And so our job is really to compensate, to say, oops, not quite ready yet. Not, it's not there. Um, it's going to come. There's a plan. Um, and, and it's not something that we can teach. It's something that will grow and develop in the right conditions. Um, we often talk about uh, gardening, and um, right now we're not in a time of gardening. We're in the winter when we're when we're everything is at rest. But a gardener creates the environment. So our job as adults is to accept the responsibility for keeping them out of trouble. And so we want to figure out, okay, what can we do to help them so things don't go badly? Because we can't really ask them to control their impulses. It's not that we can't manage a situation if one child is wanting to hurt another child. Obviously, we have to manage that situation. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Our job is to keep them out of trouble. Our job is to keep them safe. Our job is to make sure they don't do uh, something that is inappropriate. But very often, and again, I know that in your centers, you often look around the center and will say, oh, that's probably not a good idea to have uh, the scissors so close down. Let's put the scissors up. So rather than always wanting to tell the children, don't touch, you know, don't touch the scissors, don't touch the, the I, I don't know, something that might be dangerous or of concern to them. Um, what we do is we set the environment up so that they're not tempted by it. Um, and, and so we, we figure out ways of, of making it easy for them to, to stay out of trouble. And I don't know if you want to add something in here. Um, no, I think we've said, okay. we've said, we've spoken to this already. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so keep them out of situations that are beyond their developmental level. So yes, sometimes, you know, asking them to be able to share or to, to do things together might be just too much for them. And sometimes we have to help them to figure out kind of what to do or how to get out of situations, but we kind of give them little things that they can do um, and things that they can say, ways that they can interact uh, that kind of keeps them out of trouble. Um, but we, we have to understand that they're not yet ready to be the masters of their own world. We are the ones that are creating a world in which they can thrive. And Eva, I did think of a story to illustrate scripting behavior. Would this Good. be the time? Yes. Uh, so there was a, a little a child who um, wanted to sit beside me at circle time. He was older, though, and actually I needed two other children to sit beside me at circle time. So what I said to him, is, and the result of that, just putting him someplace else across from me, was that he was being foolish and not cooperating and flopping down. And you've all seen all of this. So I went to him before circle and I said, um, um, Aaron, you're going to sit across from me at circle today, right beside Heather. And I am going to be watching you and we'll sing together. And then when it's lunchtime, you'll sit beside me. And it, I scripted for him exactly what I expected and why I was doing what I was doing. And we never had a problem from that point on. I had to remind him periodically. Yes. 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 But you, you made it, you set it up so that he understood what he was doing and what you were going to do and how it was all going to play out. Right. Yeah. 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 And again, just for all of these things that we're suggesting to you, we know that with some children, this will work beautifully. Um, and it's probably something that you are already doing with some children and please keep doing it. Um, for other children, you're going to try it. 
and it might not work so well and you might want to try it again just to see and if it, that doesn't work well then we're going to give you some other solutions and, and suggestions of things that you can try but it's very important that we not forget that we have a picture in our mind of how things can work but we have to share that with the children and we have to kind of help them walk through what's going to happen in the next little bit and how it's all going to to work out and we need to to anticipate and prevent incidents. Um, sometimes, you know, we just need to to realize that, oops, this could be trouble. And we're going to help them out. Um, you know, if uh, uh, and again, I think, Lena, you probably have a lot of examples of how we can help them out, but not necessarily correct them. Correcting means that that we want them to kind of change themselves. Um, and they will gradually change over time. But because their brain is slow in developing, we're going to need lots and lots of time before it can kind of the, the penny can drop, so to speak. Um, and so we need to be very careful because sometimes we just want them to learn the lesson. Could you please just learn to share? Could you just please learn to notice that the other child is there? But it isn't going to necessarily happen that way. But it will change when the brain matures. And I wanted to speak to this picture a little bit because it illustrates so much of what you're talking about, Eva, what we're saying here. Um, in this case, I'm just sitting quietly with a child who is learning to eat grapes. Now the grapes are cut and he's probably not in any danger. However, it's one of those foods that can be a problem for swallowing for a child. So I'm just setting the stage with him, keeping him close, but I'm not alarming him by talking about um, choking. And um, I'm not teaching him a lesson about how to eat. I'm letting him do it, but I'm there to catch him. I remember when my daughter was little, uh, we would go to the playground and she would be at the top of the bars. And it was my feeling that I shouldn't ever say no to when she was climbing uh, or being brave, taking risks. Rather, what I saw my job as was to be there to catch her if she fell, which happened <laughs> a couple of times. No big deal. <laughs> and she wasn't hurt. And she still you know, has a sense of adventure. She always did. But that's the kind of thing we're talking about. We, we just sort of stay close. Um, sometimes I would put a pillow near um, an obstacle that a crawler, a very small infant, was trying to get into something, but they couldn't quite do it on their own. Just putting a pillow nearby, a firm pillow, they, without saying anything, they would just put their foot on it and then they would be in the box or whatever. That's the kind of thing we're talking about, being quietly in the background, but being very, very alert. Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, is, is not easy to do when you have a number of children in your care. Um, but I think that we sometimes um, just try too hard to kind of move them along in their development. So again, the patience, uh, the slowness of pace, I, I think can be very, very helpful to children. Um, and this brings us to looking at uh, really kind of the rhythm in our classrooms. Oops, yeah. sorry, I didn't went there too fast, yeah. Well, um, when thinking about um, planning, uh, the, 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 I mean, and, and you probably, as Eva has said a million times, you are already doing this. So we're just, we're just going over it again as to what the reasons are behind it. And for me, the planning um, and order and rhythm um, makes the day less complicated for the child. They don't have to think on a certain level. They know what's coming next, just like with the seasons. We know what's coming next. And part of this planning that I did was I thought of all the transitions in the day um, about what time they would be happening if they involved the whole group and so on and made it made kind of a calendar of the day. And then I would introduce them so we're talking about what happens when they come in the room. What happens, you know, and it was always, they had to wash their hands with their parents, the parents checked the diaper, and then they were off. And they usually came to their primary caregiver. 
but I also had songs to go with each of these transitions. When it was time to eat, when it was time for circle, when it was time to go outside, I had a song. A song enters the brain in a completely different way. It's very gentle for a child. And again, you know this because you're working with children. You probably sing all day long. I sang all day long. And I found that it was a way to manage the, the work because the children had time to adjust and it was melodious and it sounded kind of sounded fun even. We had um, songs for picking up the room. You know, there were just songs for each transition for um, each task even had a song. So this order of things really helps to manage the day in a beautiful way. And the daily activities that are set and they happen every day are one thing, they're, they're consistent, but they're also things that change. And maybe you hit, maybe you bake, well, we baked on Monday. I don't know what, what, you, what you do, but we made, we made our snack uh, rolls or whatever. But whatever it is that changes daily, um, some things remain the same. And we also found that having every um, item in the classroom to have its place also made for a very seamless uh, play situation. The children knew where that basket of mittens was because putting on mittens and boots was actually the, the biggest play for the young toddlers. Um, they didn't have to look for things. They knew where they were. Each doll had its basket and the basket was in the same place and so on and so forth. And this just meant they could go in, find what they wanted. They didn't have to look around and search. Outside wasn't quite like that, of course, um, because we were in nature and there the fun is exploring and finding out where things are. But this sense of order reduces stress, makes the child stay in kind of a dreamy state they can just find what they want and go about their day. And then they know what's coming next. And when you have the cue of the song, like uh, we sang for washing hands, you have the cue of the diaper time, all of it. Uh, it just makes the mood of the room very um, lifted. Eva? Yeah, yeah, so. I just, <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, now we also just another thought, and I think again, this is um, your experience that is really helpful here. Is just sometimes we um, we forget how children love to do the things that the adults do. Oh, we're getting to that. Yes. 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 Okay. Should do you want me to talk about that a little yes, bit? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Please. Um, so part of the planning that we also did uh, to, to keep the children engaged during the day, it was very important that we made this a home because home is where everything starts, right? So this was, we were trying to create a home-like uh, feeling. And that meant finding opportunities to be engaged in the work of caring for the room, caring for the home, and to include the children in that. Children are naturally very imitative. And one of the ways they learn how to be in the world as we orient them to the world is by giving them opportunities to engage with us in activities that we would be doing anyway. So laundry folding, um, let's see, we have putting the dolls to bed, uh, cleaning the cubby area, sweeping out that cubby area and taking everything out of the cubbies and sorting them. So much preparation for reading in the future through sorting, getting mittens together, getting boots together, finding everything, putting it in its place. Um, we would sweep, we had the carpet sweeper and the way I managed that was by a song. I would hold the carpet sweeper with the child and sing a song. And when that song was done, it was the next person's turn. So there was no fighting. There was, you know, it was kind of, it, that was, one of the times when it was actually pretty seamless. Um, we washed dishes and then we rewashed them, but uh, <laughs> having tubs of water with towels on the floor and washing dishes and tables, I turned the tables upside down and we scrubbed the bottoms of them. And all of the time we would have little songs to go with this. Um, 
and you know putting away toys and so on but this was creating a home and this was also creating a chance for the teacher to be joyfully engaged in work that was worthy of their imitation and this happened outdoors and indoors that we would try to be actively engaged that was my planning what are the things i'm going to do flower arranging i'm going to do um, ironing silks which i did in the classroom ironing play cloths whatever um, that was one of those instances where the iron had its place and it was far away from the child um, but this is a chance to build imitation to build engagement to build relationship last time we talked about times of bodily care as relationship builders so when you're diapering when you're getting a child dressed and so on this is a perfect opportunity to really make it fun and engaging for the child because attachment is the womb of maturation and these are all chances for the child to feel attached and in relationship with you through work yeah because they see you doing the work as the adult and they kind of want to be like you and that yeah. and that yeah yeah, I think it's sometimes we forget the power of some of these very simple activities that can be very helpful and they're good for muscle development and all sorts of things as well. Yes. The other thing which I think we need to remember about is, again, just the issue of time. And um, as you know, Lena and I are quite two different personalities, I'm kind of a kind of a quick one. Move, move ahead. Let's get going. <laughs> Um, but as we've been talking and as I've been as uh, as we've been really thinking about deeply about what these little ones need, um, it's it's had an impact on me as well of just remembering, oh, my goodness, they do need time to process the information and their world. There is so much going on and their brain has to take it in. And so um, Elena has introduced um, the, thought, the idea of of waiting time. So if you want to just talk a little bit about this, Lena. Yes. Uh, so just to read what's on the slide and then to embellish that a little bit. Um, time to process information in the world, because what we see with, with that play picture of the little boy building that huge thing, he was putting the pieces together. You know, and they, and they need time and space to do that. Uh, and we call that rest in a way where they're not preoccupied with anything. They're just able to rest and integrate. And waiting time refers to a short space of time which is left to allow a child thinking space in between your invitation to them to do something and them responding. So an example of that would be drop off in the morning. And particularly with an infant, I work with with children from um, birth to to three or four, uh, and and kept them. They were with me for for three years. Um, that's not typical, but that's something we implemented and worked very well. Um, anyway, the child is being brought to me uh, and um, for drop off, and it's time for mom or dad to leave. And I would say, mommy is going to hand you to me now and I'm going to take care of you. And then I'd wait. And you'd see the child would turn back into their mother um, or their father, or they would turn towards me. And, and I, but I gave them the time to respond. And then I held them and we had our joyful reunion and I spoke warmly to the mother and, and and then could put the child down and they would be on their way. That is the waiting time, the wait between telling a child what you're going to do. I'm going to pick you up now. Wait. Then you'll see a little movement. You'll see something in their eyes. It's a form of collecting the child, giving them time to respond to what you're saying. Should you happen to get a negative response, which happens all the time, um, particularly at drop off, of course, they don't want mommy to leave. You say what I said. Um, I know you don't want mommy to leave. It's really hard when mommy leaves. I'm going to take you now and I will take care of you. And then the mother and I would do that exchange and the child might cry. They might not. 
but there comes a point where things are inevitable and you have to do it with, whether they are in agreement with that or not, but to acknowledge that they're not particularly feeling in agreement with it is the first step I found to um, making that transition happen in a way that respected the child's feelings. So we, we really here are um, just reminding you again, all of us again, that the pace is there for a reason. Um, it's there because there's just so much for these children to process. And so when we think about planning our day, and of course it is very important that there be a plan, as Lena said, it reassures the children when um, they know that something's coming. Uh, we also have a responsibility to make sure that we provide a variety of experiences to children um, so that they can develop all aspects of, of, their, of their brain. Um, but we just need to be very aware of planning a day in such a way that we don't always have to be rushing the children. There are some things that we just have to do. And of course, when you have a number of children in your care, it can be quite rushed, but just kind of a fine balance because the more I know for me, and this has been a huge learning for me, the more I understand about how the brain develops, the more I realize that rest and space are just as important as putting information into the brain. And so it has to be a fine balance between those two things. And again, we have uh, six other sessions. We're going to, as we go through the sessions, we're going to hopefully help you to find ways in which to, to, to meet the needs of children um, in, in a society in which they need to live. The third thing that we need to understand about our little ones is that they do have big problems with separation. And we did talk about that in session one, we're going to talk about that in session three. We're going to look much more deeply at attachment and how attachment unfolds. But just as a, as a reminder um, is we just need to remember that they have a huge fear of separation, which can be overwhelming and crippling. And, and again, we every morning we ask them to separate from their parents to come to us. And at the end of the day, we ask them to separate from us to go back to their parents. There's many separations, but this is, of course, how our world works. And um, again, for, um, for many of us, sharing the responsibilities of caring for children is one of the ways in which to make their world a safe place. Um, and so it's part of what we need to, to do for children. It's just as, as Lena said, the child has to be dropped off, but we just need to remember how deep this is, how deep their hunger for contact and connection is, and that it takes precedence over every other need. You know, they really is a very strong thing for them. And very often when we see troubling behavior, it is linked to separation problems. And again, many of you know the stories of the children who come to your center and some of their stories are stories of separation. And of course, when we talk, when we go later on, as we go through the sessions, we're going to be talking more and more about some of the things that can be upsetting to children and therefore upsetting to us. And we're gonna talk about what to do, but we know that that this the story of separation is a very profound story that affects what's happening in a child's world. But there's nothing wrong with a child who lives that intensely because being in attachment is what keeps a child safe. Um, they have a huge preoccupation with belonging and it drives their emotion and their behavior. They just want to be together. And again, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that, you know, children who constantly want to play together and then fight two seconds later, but they want to be together. And then there's another fight. And we just need to understand that, although we might need to manage who gets to play with whom, because sometimes it just can't seem to, to function very well, but that the desire to be there is a, such a normal human desire. And as a result, unfortunately, they're easily wounded by perceived signs of disapproval or not mattering. Um, again, this is something that um, I know that I would have to keep working on um, is, is just remembering what my face looks like because we can be frustrated with a child. Um, we can be, and, and very often it's not even frustration with a child that's appearing on our face. It's that, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do now? I don't quite know what to do next. And, and for some, for children who are very sensitive, they look at us and they go, don't you love me? And it's constantly there. Um, I don't know, Rena, if you want to add something to this. 
Well, it's uh, thank you, Eva. It is um, an emotional separation when we have a look of disapproval, um, or if we if the child feels perceives that they don't matter to us, and hence um, it, they are wounded, uh, wounded to the quick is what we say here. And I think even as adults, we can remember or have a have had these moments where disapproval or being ignored in some way, not intentionally, um, really is upsetting. For practices, of course, we're gonna go into this in the second half quite, quite thoroughly, but just, it can't be said enough um, that they notice each other. They notice, they can tell me who's on vacation, um, they know who's not at the table. They know who's not at the circle. They know who's not there. They matter. They get mattering in a way that's, that's really quite developed by the time they're th two and three years old. They want to know where every member of their class is, every person they're attached to. Um, if I'm going to be gone for a period of time, I always leave them a sign like, there's my cup, I'll be back, this kind of thing. But to create a, a, a community where mattering um, is, is a, a principle of practice, um, making sure that people feel as though they matter. And to work, I think I have had to work a lot on, on those small facial gestures of disapproval and instead find kind words to correct a situation. Yes, and again, in the second half of what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be sharing some practices with you that will respond to these separation issues that children at this age have. Um, and again, they're little, they're little gestures, they're little acts, um, and we just need to remember how important they are because we actually develop, and this is something that is very unique to Dr. Neufeld, um, not many people have people talk about attachment and I'm sure if uh, if you've done some studies um, uh, after high school about the needs of young children you've you've looked at the needs of attachment but Dr. Neufeld actually looked at it in more depth and and this is what we're going to be to be um, talking about next next time is um, how bit by bit through the early childhood years the capacity for hanging on to holding on to someone of keeping a relationship when we're apart develops uh, because as we all know we have to as human beings eventually become independent and autonomous but that doesn't mean we don't need relationships and oh my goodness um, at this moment in time when with the pandemic that we're living through with the fact that we're constantly being allowed to be with people that we love and then not allowed to be we've we've as, as adults have felt the huge loss in that and how hard that is on us and so but our children <clears throat> haven't yet found ways they don't have that mature way of figuring out how they can hold up on when apart yeah. And that is why they are so, so sensitive and vulnerable to real and perceived separations. It isn't just whether someone is gone, it's whether someone isn't going to come back, or if they're maybe going to behave in a way that will just, somebody will disapprove of them and not want to love them. So it's very complex. So we just need to remember that because what happens is when, when you feel separation, there's three big emotions that happen intensified pursuit, where we would do everything we can to get that relationship back. Usually we don't mind children like that, but some of them, as you know, can be extremely clingy. They don't want to let go of your leg because that's the only way they know that they can hang on to you and you've got to go do something else. Or they can become very alarmed, very scared, start to become very anxious, start to, 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 to especially if they can talk, to start to say things like, I'm scared, I'm worried, what if this, what if this, what if that, and maybe, you know, just the alarm goes up, the anxiety goes up, or they can become very frustrated, like this little guy here, oh, you know, it's going to be a strong emotion, and of course, that does result in troubling behavior. And one of the messages, again, that we need to remember is that if we meet the attachment needs of a child, we can go around and modulate some of these incredibly big emotional reactions. So 
we again need to figure out how we can become the answer. Now, I think we've probably left you with more questions than answers, but you've been sitting very still for a while. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to ask Cheryl to join us um, and just uh, maybe share some of her thoughts about some of the things that we talked about. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. Well, there was a whole lot of information uh, given there and, uh, you know, but when, we, when I look back on it and see the things that hit home was one of the things that uh, Lena said was we're united by love for our children. And yes, this is something that, that's, uh, that's great in, in a parent, you know, when they have a child, that bonding, that attachment that occurs uh, you know, is, uh, is really, you know, intensified at the beginning, the baby's small, the baby, you know, you have to care for it because they can't do very much for themselves. And, um, you know, the, the more time spent doing that, the more love that is uh, an attachment, bonding and attachment is occurring between both parent and child. And, um, you know, nature as a plan for us you know this is something big as well because i like that seasons picture where you see the seasons and i've given a, a workshop on uh, culture um, you know the the seasons of what the first nations do and you know the season yes winter is a time for waiting it's a time for hibernating you know for, it's a time for uh, you can't do very much when it's very cold like today like People are told to, to stay inside so that they don't get, uh, you know, frostbite and stuff like this. But for us, you know, I was thinking about that and thinking about going to camp, you know, when uh, back in the old days, you know, we'd be preparing. We'd be preparing for this time. Mm -hmm. In the summer, we'd have to pick berries and, you know, we'd make jams for conserve and, you know, uh, We'd, we'd get meat, you know, the, the animals that we could hunt in the summertime and either uh, make, a, you know, like I should say, put them, smoke them so that they could be eaten during the winter months, because this is what our people survived upon. And in the winter months, you know, the men were the hunters, you know, they hunted deer, beaver, rabbit, bear, fish, partridge, goose, duck, caribou. And uh, the women, you know, were hunters as well. They were more like gatherers. They'd snare rabbits. They'd go fishing with the children, you know, and they'd be teaching the children, you know, stuff inside the, the, the teepee or the home. And um, the women would, would cook. They'd dry those meats that was, uh, and cook them over the open fire. And I was thinking of a time where, you know, you talked about responsibility, you know, like we have to be, aware of what a child could do because in the winter months I remember you know um, my grandparents used to sew they'd sew uh, moccasins or they'd sew mitts or they'd sew, be sewing something but I was never allowed to touch the needle <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know because I was too young and they recognized that and but one of the things that I was allowed to do was I was allowed to put my arms out <laughs> and they would roll yarn around them. <laughs> and that was a long process. That would last uh, like an hour long. It felt like an hour, but it probably was like 20 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, like I think us as uh, educators of children, this is uh, a part of our responsibility to recognize where they are at. Like you're not going to ask a baby to answer a question when they can't even talk type of thing. And, you know, when I, I look at this, you know, recognizing the risk factors, you know, these are, are things that my grandparents and would, my parents would prepare me for, not to go close to the fire, you know, not to burn yourself on the, you know, there was measures taken so that you weren't uh, put at risk and um, 
like you said something too that hit me eva is is that you said what they see is what they experience and this is something that we as caregivers you know like we don't uh, always see what they see at home and sometimes we're dealing with it depending on the age of the child they can tell you what happened but some of them can't they don't have the verbal skills to to say what happened or what's bothering them and sometimes it comes out through a song you know i remember i used to sing uh, if you're happy and you know it but some children weren't happy singing that song and then a change it uh, when you're angry and you know it you know stomp your feet yeah. and then you'd see the, the the frustration you know and it was a means to get that frustration out and uh, you know thinking uh, along those lines you know like a, when you think about a baby your face is a tool your face is what they see you know your 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 expression your temperament and even they feel it you know like if you're holding them a little bit tight today <laughs> or you know what i mean like it's i until i had the you know the responsibility of taking care of children on my own i i understand that now like a baby can feel uh, can sense your feelings i should say so you know these are are things like that i had to work on myself you know my my temperament with the children to make sure okay you know this is what we're going to get out of the way and it's a new day for me and you and now we're going to start over we can start this day over any time we want to so these are are some of the things that i've learned and i like what you said about the, the brain you know in algonquin we call it wind dib and the way you said that, Eva, you said that uh, the balance, there needs to be a balance between rest and space. You know, if you're given too much information, information's always going in, it's going in, it's going in, but there's no rest period and there's no space, no time to absorb the information that's going in. This is where you, you can hit a brick wall. <laughs> Because the child will just stop. And I've noticed that, you know, like when there's too much information coming in, okay, uh, I got to stop here. And you lost them. Like, <laughs> yeah, they, they certainly let us know, don't they, by their, by their nonverbal or verbal behavior. <laughs> so I found that like really like hitting home and, you know, um, as uh, First Nations, like we give children their responsibility as, as their age uh, that pertains to their age, you know, like you can't just let somebody, uh, a child run outside when they're, you know, just beginning to walk. You don't know what they're going to eat. You don't know where they're going to go. You know, you don't know what's out there that might get them. So these things that, that, uh, you know, that this is a way, you know, we have to almost predict, you know, what our next steps are going to be. We, uh, as educators, it's our responsibility to make sure that their environment is safe. And we got to predict, you know, those potential hazards. And um, I like what you said about the daily routine, you know, like how important is a daily routine to children to helping them feel that sense of security to helping them feel, you know, I'm home, I'm comfortable here. And you and I both know that, you know, in a, an environment where we feel unsafe, we're not going to be giving that much information, you know. We're going to be all, everything's going to be alert and we'll be listening to everything to make sure that we're in a safe place. But once we get that security down, then now this is a time where we could absorb and we could say, hey, you know what, what they are saying or what she's doing seems right. It feels right. Uh, I think I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, you, you're, you're a developmentalist at heart, for sure, Cheryl. <laughs> because when the time is right, when we create the conditions, the natural desire to learn and grow, it's there, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. And, um, you know, like I think about those times where just being with my grandparents, you know, like uh, my grandfather used to tie apples to the tree, the apple tree. It wasn't even an apple tree. I think it was like, a... <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted to give us experience of picking apples. So the, the, he used to use like we we get this meat string from the grocery store to tie the meat up, right? So he take that string and cut it, and he buy a bag of apples and tie the apples to the tree, so that we could have the experience of what he saw in the states, because they go to work in the states for months and they would come back and over there there was apple trees and down there there wasn't too many. <laughs> So, you know, like these experiences, you know, even though it wasn't real, but it was like real. <laughs> but, but what a wonderful man that he wanted to, exp to expose you to, to another world that, you know, so like he th was thinking about, about your, you as children and creating a world that was magical for you, right? Yeah, that's, that's totally it. And, you know, like to see that is... Uh, was yeah. something else, you know, and now I think about it today and I, I think, you know, those weren't real apples. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> but we, you know, as, as caregivers, you know, we try to give the children experiences, you know, I guess more of what we didn't have either. Because mm -hmm. he didn't have that as a child, but he wanted us to see it at some point and maybe thinking we'll never, you know, get to see an apple tree ever. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it was very, very uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, and I think um, we're going to probably be just about ready to, to take a break. Well, welcome back, everyone. And so we just want to um, uh, just respond to a question that is very timely, I believe. And the question was about um, the development of the prefrontal cortex for student, for children um, who have uh, special needs. And it's again, it's hard because when we talk about a child with special needs, it can mean many, many things. But the prefrontal cortex is the most complex part of the brain, and it does require the most optimum conditions to develop. So I would say it's generally um, understood that children who uh, come to us with particular needs who seem to not be developing um, in, in the way that other children are developing that the prefrontal cortex will take longer to develop. Um, and so it's, it's quite likely that you might have a child who is, um, you know, four, maybe even going on five years old, but who isn't showing any signs at all of mixing emotions or mixing thoughts. Who are still very one track minded can only think about themselves. Um, for the children who are who look different, um, it's usually easier easier for us to have patience with them because we can tell by the way they look physically that there might be something going on different inside of them. Where it's really challenging is when the child seems on the outside, like physically they're developing well, but when their brain has been affected by, again, some kind of a particular syndrome or something. So, but I would say, yes, if you have a child who's identified with a special need, you will, you, you will expect that it will be harder for them. If they show the prefrontal cortex development as it should be, that's lovely, but it will probably come a bit later, for some of them quite a bit later. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we're just going to continue here. And we left off with be the answer. So how do we be the answer? Well, as we know, first of all, the first answer that we need to, to do is to respond to that question, who is taking care of me? And as I mentioned earlier on, and I think we will keep mentioning it, and by the way, we know that we are sharing a lot of information with you. Um, it's just one of those challenges that we have because human beings are so complex. Um, and uh, we want to be able to inform you. We want to give you new information um, without overwhelming, but sadly, sometimes that happens. But um, as if you go through the course with us, if you have patience with us, you will hear similar themes coming over and over again that will, I think, eventually land and help you to make sense in your own way. And that's the other beauty of this approach is that 
each of us is a unique human being and each of us has gifts that we give to the children. Uh, again, one of the wonderful things in a family or in a community or in, in a childcare center is that all the different personalities each bring something very special to a child. Um, when I was working uh, more in schools and guiding staff in a school, sometimes they would get frustrated with each other because they would say, oh, we're not all acting the same. I said, you don't have to all act the same because each of you is bringing your gifts to that child and you, you'll be responding to a different need for that child at different ways. So that's why we don't, you know, try not to tell you exactly what to do because you have to make it your own. So of course we need to make sure that every time we interact with children, we're reassuring them that someone is taking care of them. And uh, here we get to see Lena again, uh, interacting with one of her children. So if you wanted to share what's going on here, Lena. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yes. So every day we know that the child is holding that question somewhere inside them because they are so dependent on the adults in their life for taking care of them. They, they know that, that they're dependent. They feel that. And so they're seeking. So we begin with, and I've already talked about this a little bit, the sense of significance and mattering. So to begin with a warm welcome in the morning when they come, um, I'm so glad you're here. Children read emotion. I think Cheryl said this in her remarks. We have to be honest, emotionally honest with children. They, they can tell. Uh, they may not consciously know what's going on, but there's a, there's a sense involved in, in honesty. So one of our charges in doing this work with young children is to really um, <laughs> mean what we say. In fact, I had a mentor teacher once who said, I mean what I say when she spoke to children and asked them to do something. But I take that in a different sense as greeting them warmly, coming from our warm hearts, whatever we do to prepare for the day to make sure that we are in that place where we can honestly greet them as at our best. Um, and then also we've already touched on creating this calm, orderly, rhythmical environment. Rhythmical meaning things happen over and over again. Uh, at the same time every day, you know what, you already have this in your rooms, of course you do, because you're feeding and you're toileting and you're going outside and you, you have a rhythm and getting it crystal clear and keeping it just moving in the direction it needs to move and adjusting it where it doesn't work is very important. And then, you know, part of why I sang so much is, uh, well, it just, it was a good excuse to sing, and I like to sing. But it was also, it, it appealed to this playfulness of children. As soon as something becomes like a task or work or a have to is associated with it, well, yeah, you kind of lose their interest. But when it's play, oh boy, everything sparks up, um, they're on board. Uh, and I don't mean silly, but I just mean playful. Um, in a, in a um, grounded way. So here I'm actually doing a, probably a little um, puppet play or something. I don't honestly remember what exactly I was saying or singing at this point, but I think it probably had to do with Humpty Dumpty falling. And you can see that the child who's with me is right there because that is what captures children, is when we approach them um, with a playful, lighthearted, warm, uh, emotional state. Yeah, so this is just it. It's through the smiling. Um, again, um, I remember my, my mother-in-law, who was uh, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful woman. I had so much admiration for her. She was the parent to seven children. Um, but when she got older, uh, for whatever reason, just the way that her wrinkles happened to fall, some of her grandchildren asked her, Grandma, why, 
why are why don't you like us and she, you know, she was such a loving person um and then she said oh you know i have to pay attention because sometimes i look like i'm not happy to see the child when i actually am so she had to really work at getting that little twinkle into her eyes of remembering to just soften her look um and it, and so this is just it and and a gentleness in speech um a lively interest in the child you know, you don't have to ask a lot of things. You just have to notice a little something. You know, if, if you don't want to talk to them, just a little kind of gesture of some sort that just says, I see you, you're there. Um, we sometimes, you know, think we have to be these fantastic superstars, but actually children look for the quiet, gentle ones. Okay? Um, there is, of course, important to remember that there are times when we are going to have to say no to children when we are going to have to they're not going to like us like the teacher who had to get her little guy in from kinder from from recess he didn't like her at that moment in time um, and sometimes um, there's a little bit of confusion because when we talk about the importance of attachment um, I've had people say to me well I had to be firm with him and he didn't like me was I doing the right thing and I said yes of course you were and all of you know this because children need to know who are the leaders and we are going to spend again a little bit of time sorting that out and talking about that um, in our session three. So boundaries are needed. Children need to know how far they can go, even if they don't like it, um, they, they need to know. And, and again, most of you can remember back to your own experiences, perhaps with a parent or a grandparent who was quite firm, but very kind. And that's that fine balance, how you're able to make sure that everyone is safe and do what needs to be done, but in a way that feels like it's kind. And it can be a challenge sometimes, right, Lena? Yes, because we are we are compensating for their natural immaturity. So we are the ones that that can set the boundaries. We know all these things. They don't know them yet. They are not yeah. oriented to the world in the same way. But they do they do want that. The child that has no boundaries is often um, very anxious at, at, in the core. Well, I'm speaking from my own experience of yeah being one of those children. Yeah. And then, of course, again, and we're going to spend a bit more time this afternoon on this, respecting the emotional experience, expression through really an openness to what the child is feeling. Uh, again, in, in sessions, and I can't remember exactly which of the sessions, we're going to go through some of the primary emotions. We're going to look at alarm. We're going to look at frustration. We're going to look at some of the things that children can feel. And of course, the, the sadness. And and um, so it's, it's very important for us to, to really respect those emotions because they are there and very necessary. Really in effect, um, and some of you know uh, Sarah Cleary, uh, this is just such a lovely, lovely picture of her with this little girl. And it's called providing an unconditional invitation to exist in our presence. Um, and I know this is what all of you have in your hearts with children. Um, but again, just remembering that sometimes we have to we have to really let them know. And, and again, we're going to talk about when things are not at their best and how we do that. So this is this is really so much of, of what it is that we're saying, because when they feel that, then their brain can rest, as Cheryl said, oh, rest happens and now learning happens. So we're going to go a little bit into when things are not going well, when emotions are high, when things are getting a little rough around the edges. Um, we have some things that we think will be helpful to you in kind of thinking through when, um, you know, when these things are going. And again, um, I know for myself and for the people that I've worked with, um, this can take quite a long time. Um, because we have good intentions, as we all do, um, but sometimes we can't make it work in the moment because our own emotions get there. So hopefully these, these little sort of um, ways of looking at things will come back to you bit by bit. We're going to put them in our, um, in our little uh, hold on to Dr. Neufeld kind of things. Um, and these, I think, will maybe help you perhaps get through the days uh, in a way that will then help the children um, with to create an emotional world or an emotional place that is safe for them. Um, and we're going to go through these in more depth. So one of them is treating the incident as an accident. So um, one child pushes another child. Oh, they didn't mean to do that. It was an accident. 
not combating emotion with reason, trying to talk children out of what they're actually feeling deep inside of them, and then really coming alongside that experience. So let's, let's start with treating the incident as an accident. Um, you know, those two little guys, we saw the picture of the, of the child who was sweeping and the child who was going to step up on the plank. Um, you know, it could well be <laughs> that the little one who has the, um, the broom in their hand is going to nudge uh, the other little one <laughs> to move along, please, because I'm trying to clean, I'm trying to clean well, here. Or it could go the other way. Yeah, so. yeah. The, the, what are you doing here? Right, bonk. <laughs> now, we could try and correct them and talk to them about what they should do or what they shouldn't do. But as I had mentioned before, it's just so much more helpful if we help them out. If somebody gets a little bit thrown apart, oh, can I take care of you? Are you okay? We just take care of them. Um, and we don't really try and talk too, too much about what you should or shouldn't do. I had a, a very dear colleague of mine. He was a wonderful, wonderful young man. He actually worked with me with adolescents, with teenagers. And he went down to, and he went to became, got a job as a kindergarten teacher. And um, he was a little worried. He said, how am I going to do this? And I said, don't worry, the adolescents you've been working with are have been a little bit more like preschoolers than you want to believe. And I said, but the preschoolers are so cute. <laughs> You'll be just fine. But when I did a little observation, because he asked me for some feedback, I found he was talking too much. You know, the little guys, he, I said, just just do what you need to do. Just move this one over here, move that one over there, brush, pick them up, brush them off, and move on to the next thing without too much talking. And the oh, interesting, have, yeah. Oh, when you're done, Eva. I'm, no, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a little story about this, um, uh, which is more what to say when something would happen. And let's use the plank and the sweeper and the foot. As, as the example, since we're that's coming up. If something happened, I go into my sportscaster mode and I'll say, oh, Grace was sweeping the plank. You wanted to get up on it and you fell. That's all I would say. Just, it's sort of like state the facts. It gives them something to chew on. And then I would say, Let's find a place for you to get on a little further down. And that would be that. And just saying to the children what is happening without judgment, completely neutral, often resolves issues. And they learn a lot from that, but it's indirect. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's that uh, you deal with the situation. And you move along. And the other interesting thing is, and I, I often found this was very powerful, is that interestingly, when we are able to do that, and your sportcaster mode is kind of not, as you said, not judgmental, not overly emotional, it's just stating the fact, and it's, you're not, you're not brushing over it, you're not saying, oh, you're okay, you're okay, you're, you're saying you didn't like this. Um, but the other children, they kind of look, and they go, oh, well, when I get into trouble, then Ms. Lena is going to tell me what went wrong and she'll help me. It's a very powerful way for the entire group to get a sense that emotions are respected, that immaturity is respected, um, and that they can be safe in that environment. And also, I love the fact that you say, I went into sportscaster mode because we as adults feel we have to do something. I mean, sometimes when we raise our voice and we're not raising our voice because we want to be mean to children, but we, we just want to do something and we're worried. Hey, that's a nice way of remembering it. The poor sport caster kind of keeps it, keeps it moving along. So I think that's, I, I think that might be one of our little, maybe not so much Dr. Neufeld statement, but one of, one of your statements is, is how we interact and do something but in effect, still respect who the children are and what's going on with them. Now, I've also noticed, Eva, that when, when a child is, for instance, upset and needs to be held in their tears because they've found their, you know, they're in tears and they're upset. I used to worry that if I gave the care to that child, that the rest of the room, because, you know, sometimes there's only one or two of us in a room, um, the rest of the room would, would fall apart or come to a shrieking halt. And what I noticed was actually when I was taking care of a child's deep emotions, the tear emotions, the rest of the room 
flowed around us. Sometimes children would come over to check, but it was just incredible how taking care of one took care of the whole. Wow. They all felt held safely. Yeah, very important to remember that. And it's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Powerful. Yeah, and so it's very tempting because we have a prefrontal cortex, right? Because we have lots of experience that we can draw on. And in our own world, I mean, again, this is one of the challenges that we need to, to also give to ourselves is to have permission to have our emotions. But as adults, there are times when we can say to ourselves, oh, this is not so bad. Um, you know, I can get through this. It's going to be okay. But when, remember, we're dealing with children who are just starting to experience what emotion really is, what feelings really are. And so we have to be very careful not to try and talk them out of it, even though we might say, oh, well, you know, it's just a little thing. It's not a big thing. But for them, everything is big. Everything is big. As I mentioned, that the end of a four-year-old birthday party, it is the worst day in their life, because that's how it feels like in that moment. Um, and of course, we know there are many times in the day uh, in a child care center when they are upset. And for example, when they're, when they're, be, they're be objecting to being left in the center. So Shalane, if you want to just talk a little bit about how, how you would respond to that. If they're upset about being left. Yeah, um, I think we might have a slide about this later on, but I'll go through it now. Because um, it can't be said often enough. A young child who doesn't have a formed relationship with the caregiver or for whatever reason doesn't want to be left, and it sometimes has nothing to do with the relationship with the caregiver, um, because they're only one thought at a time, right? So if they're attached to mom, they're not going to be attached to me. And that's why we have trouble at the end of the day, too, as Eva's already brought up, because if they're attached to me, they're not going to be attached to mom. It, there's always this bridging that has to happen. So I would, I would say to the child, um, I, I know you don't want mommy to leave. It's hard when she leaves, I'm going to take care of you. And if they have tears, I just stay with them through their tears. Yeah, because yeah, sometimes it's tempting to say, oh, you're okay, don't cry, mommy will be back. We're trying to reassure the child, but actually we need to go to what's actually happening with them. And I know sometimes people say, well, aren't you making them feel worse? You can't make them feel worse when they're already feeling pretty badly, right? So there it is, you don't like it when mommy leaves. You know, it's hard when daddy goes. And we and just, is, yeah, and this is what we're calling making room for the emotion. Just make room for it. Don't talk somebody out of it. And if we, when we make room for it, I mean, I, I know um, you can probably think, all of you can probably think of times when somebody didn't make room for your emotion and tried to talk you out of it. Um, sometimes that's a good journaling exercise to kind of bridge to how the children are feeling. Um, the difference that you experience when somebody is able to hold your emotion and not talk you out of it is yes. very similar to what the young child is experiencing too. And we can do that. I do wanna add, there are times when a child is stuck in their emotion and then you do need to move them. This is the art of what we're doing. Yes. There's no one right, right way or wrong way to do this. There just yes. isn't. Yeah, you try different things. And you see what works, but you have what we call basic guiding principles. And the guiding principle here is that when a child is experiencing an emotion, we try and respect it as much as we can. But sometimes we have to move them along and then realize, okay, we're going to have to deal with this later because emotions come back. They don't just magically go away. They will come back. So when a child is really upset, frustrated about something, sad about something, um, again, Try to come close, speak gently, and reflect what you think is happening in their world. Oh, you're sad because daddy had to leave. Or you can say, it's scary right now. You know, you're worried. 
um, you know, maybe daddy came late yesterday. And so now you might be saying, well, you're scared he's going to be late today. Naming what it is that they're experiencing is very reassuring to a child. It means, okay, you get me. And this is okay right now, because it is scary, you know, if, especially if you had an experience, or if they're frustrated, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't working for you right now. That wasn't what you had in mind. You wanted your grandmother to stay. You wanted her to stay. And now she has to go because she got a phone call, and she has to go. So we, we put words to the emotional experience that we believe is happening inside of them. Um, and sometimes it can be even to the point where they have screams and bites and pushes in, in them. You know, and again, we acknowledge that. And then sometimes we have to actually, especially with these very intense emotions, especially the ones of frustration, um, we have to help them to find a way through. Um, and by again, naming, well, frustration is an emotion where something is not working. So we go, oh, that's not working for you. Or your frustration needs to come out here. Let me help you. And here is something you can hit or something you can stomp out. And then I believe that you've actually done this with children yeah. in your care. Well, one, Dr. Newfeld, in one of the first courses that I took from him, um, talked about demonstrating, uh, modeling a temper tantrum. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to trust this. I'm going to feel like an idiot, but I'm going to do it. And I did it. And, um, you know, you can see the little fellow on the left is, is starting to stomp because some incident had happened and I going, oh, I'm so frustrated and stomp my feet and so on. And pretty soon they adjust. Uh, a lot of them um, who started out with hits and bites and pushes and so on actually began to use other ways to let it out because we would always say, you're very frustrated. That needs to come out. That is not the way. Let me help you. And this is, this is actually a rule that I've taken into life. Eva, you mentioned how things have changed in your life since, since learning some of these um, uh, things from the paradigm, ways that emotion works. It's, it's been useful for me as well. Yeah. Your frustration needs to come out. It's made me a much more forgiving person, quite frankly. Um, instead of saying, you can't talk to me that way or something, just recognizing that frustration needs to come out with the caveat, this is not the way. Let me help. Let me help <laughs> you find help another you. way. Find a way. Yeah, yeah, we're going to find a way. And, and it's sometimes with some of the children, and again, we're going to have a whole session that will look more specifically at frustration. Of course, some of the children have many, many things that are not working in their life. They have a lot to get out. Um, and uh, we'll try and give you some suggestions of things that you can do. But actually, I, I worry less about the children who do easily let it out. I worry more about the children who hold it all in because they too have an emotional world, but they're, they, they, it isn't moving through them. So really, um, so much of what we can do and so much of um, our daily practice with our children is just being there with them, generously providing more proximity than they're asking for, and then helping them to grieve what cannot be changed. Um, and I think just before we move on to, to elaborating a little bit more on those two points, um, I just think that this picture here of an adult who is close to the children, and I believe, Lena, she's not actually playing with them, right? No. So part of what we practiced based on these principles was to be a soft, we called it to be a soft presence. Um, we would stay close where trouble might be coming, uh, which you can see these two are about to collide midstream on that bridge. Um, and we would wait. So we practiced waiting quite a bit and being there reassured the children and also kept the factor of safety uh, for everybody involved in mind. And, you know, we normalized a lot of things, normalizing crying, biting, hitting, all of these things. 
And by that, I do not mean that we allowed it, but we accepted that it was a normal part of their development. I had a little boy who was a biter and after lunch, I would say, oh, Micah, it's your biting time. Here's your mat. And because that's actually was true. He was tired and, and so on. And um, here's something for you to bite on. And yeah, the other children are gonna have a little story over here. You're gonna wait here and so on and so forth. Um, and that solved it. We didn't, we had, everything went down in terms of our accident reports and biting and so on. When we started normalizing the fact that these are impulses that cannot be controlled by the child and no amount of talking to them about it is going to solve it. We have to take responsibility for it and keep everybody safe. Um, the little girl that you see trying to get up there on the box on the right, uh, was was also a biter and she had something that she wore around her neck and that solved that problem to, to bite on and she felt like she had to bite. Yeah. So these are the classroom <laughs> dilemmas because they really, you know, with lack of impulse control, no amount of good intentions is going to stop them. No. No. And they get, I think we get exhausted by talking and talking and trying to teach them and they get exhausted by trying to listen. In fact, the little ones will just put their hands over their ears. Um, and so, so therefore, and again, a developmental approach basically says, if we work with it when they're little, they will grow into it naturally. You know, naturally they will start saying, oh, I felt like biting, but I didn't. But that doesn't happen until five to seven years old. So we have to give that space. Um, generosity is a huge, huge thing for children. Um, you know, we, we um, again, we, I don't know if we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, maybe not, and I think maybe it was in the other course, where actually when we give to children, it fills them up. And then they actually want to do things themselves. But again, and I know when you have many, many children, it's lovely if they can get themselves dressed. But in the little acts of caring, in the little helping, we should make sure that we do it in a way that makes it feel really generous. So we help them just before they ask, you know? I mean, you're letting them do it on their own, but then you just step in if you can, just that moment. So they feel like, oh, she's noticing me. Or sometimes even carrying them when they can walk. Again, some might not have enough arms for some of these children, but the research has shown that babies that are picked up or young toddlers that are picked up when they cry to be picked up, if they're picked up right away, that they actually become more independent walkers than the ones in which the parents say, oh, you can walk on your own. Again, that's a challenge when you have many children, but that act of generosity actually um, causes children to want to become more independent. And we can do this by doing tasks together or by inviting their participation, just all the little ways in which we can bring a child close to ourselves. And notice the big, I, is it obvious that this child is smiling? Is it, this is a playful moment too. And notice his barefoot. <laughs> and my Are you tickling hand. his foot there? <laughs> I don't know. Not intentionally, but it looks that way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, again, we say to ourselves, well, I mean, I have so many children in my care. How can I make each child feel welcome? Um, you know, again, you know that you probably uh, each child would need five minutes from you and you only have two and a half minutes to give. Um, but it's really in that two and a half minutes, if you can remember that two and a half minutes of generosity will fill that child up even though you wish it could be five minutes. Like sometimes we get stuck. Our own, our little prefrontal cortex kind of mixes us up because we say, oh, I wish he could give him five minutes. Oh, I can't give him five minutes. And then we get discouraged rather than thinking, I'm going to give him the best minute I can. <laughs> just one little minute, one little thing, just sipping up that zipper, just with a big smile on my face. You know, that's all I can do. And for that child, they just feel like, sunshine has come upon them when that smile is there right they are they're so needful of that so again just just thinking because we have this odd again it's two different approaches one is a developmental approach which trusts that as human beings we want to become independent and autonomous or a learning approach which says we have to teach people to become independent and they're two very different approaches 
but no more do you need to teach a caterpillar to become a butterfly than you need to teach a child to become independent. They will become independent, but they have to have they have to have the conditions and the best conditions are feeling that the people around them are taking care of them. So providing generously, I, again, I, my experience is more in classrooms with teachers. I often say to a teacher, just giving the child a pencil with a smile on your face can do that. So just a little act can do a huge thing for a child. Yes. And then, of course, the grieving and the tears and the sadness. And we will spend another session on this as well. Um, because children, so many, many things that do not work in a child's life and so many times that they need to, to feel sad about what cannot change. And so we need to hold them in their sadness. You know, and if you don't know what to say, better not to say very much. Just hum a song, hum or sing something, just make a little noise. And, you know, you don't have to say anything. You just have to be there. Or you can also talk a little bit about your sad that daddy's going. You wish that your Nana could stay. I mean, we can say those things, but I'm getting more and more of the, of the, um, of the idea that it's what we do that impacts children. We don't need to talk about it too, too much, but we do sometimes need to put words on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's very, very important uh, that we let them have the sadness that they need to feel. There's lots of, lots of stuff. Now I'm going to uh, share with you here something that might be a bit controversial. And um, I, um, I, I always feel badly about this because uh, in my career as a, school, as a psychologist, um, these were things that I was trained to do. Uh, these were things that I was uh, asked, that I, I felt I had to tell people to do to help manage uh, situations that were challenging, uh, behaviors that were not going the way that we thought they should. Um, and I had to actually um, quite radically change my perspective for two big reasons. The first one was my own children. A lot of this stuff did not work, especially with my daughter. <laughs> And my daughter was very verbal and she could tell me. So part of my brain already started to say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. This is not a good idea. And then bit by bit, as I started to study more and more about how to help adults help the children who were struggling, it became very clear to me. And I watched wonderful, wonderful adults deal with very, very challenging situations and I saw them doing the opposite of what I was telling people to do. They were kinder to the children who were struggling the most. And those were the people that had the biggest impact. And then I started studying Dr. Neufeld's work and all the pieces fell into place. But I had already been searching for an explanation for why certain things that we think would fix a child's behavior actually make it worse. And I call these discipline practices that divide because they actually cause emotional separation. Um, and so the ones that we are, that are classic, that are out there, possibly you might have been taught in some of your courses. Um, and again, I, I say this with a big heartbreak because we thought these things should help, but when we really think it through, they actually, as I say, don't. So time out, where we're separating a child. That doesn't mean to say we can't have a child go somewhere else to spend a little bit of time by themselves or with somebody else. Um, sometimes we need to separate two children. It's not that we can't separate mm -hmm. children, but it's time out is about usually sending a child away and send, saying to them, you go over there, you think about what you did and when you're ready to come back. Well, what that basically says to the child is it's up to me. I have to change myself to have permission to come back to the presence of the adult. Um, and so that's already a separation. Consequences, when we take away something that a child is attached to because we want to change their behavior. Now, if they are, you know, if, if, that, if that child who's got the broom always uses the broom to hit other children, we're going to make sure that they maybe will use a pool noodle instead of a broom to pretend to sweep because it can't hurt people. So we do take charge of things, but not because we want to change their behavior, but because it's in their best interest. Um, also, by the way, when we take things away that, that kids are attached to, they don't really like us very much. Any kind of a reward system where children have to earn either a, a red light or a green light or a star um, to, to, 
you know, to be, you know, to behave in a way that will get a star, that really means what we're saying to them for you to please me, you have to act in a certain way. Well, they shouldn't have to do that. Or even at the end of the day, and I don't know if, if child care centers use this, but I, I actually, this was brought to my attention by a mother in who was picking up her daughter, her son from, from child care. She said, at the end of the day, he would get so many red faces that it was a bad day. And he never even wanted to talk to me anymore. He would just have a meltdown. And that's when I realized, oh my goodness, a red face means that mommy can't love me. And that was just terrifying for that little guy. Because what we now know is that, first of all, that prefrontal cortex is not functioning. So they can't think about things. They can't look at the little red face at the end of the day and say, I'm going to be a better kid tomorrow. That's way too much in the future for them. They can't think about what they did wrong. Um, you know, and, and the other thing is that if they have to earn a star or a reward, which in effect is also our smile, that makes the attachment conditional. And the biggest fear that all children have, and some of them can, can verbalize it. I remember a little four-year-old girl, girl saying to her mommy, I don't know if I can be good enough tomorrow. Will you still love me? So we think that these things help with behavior, but my experience right now is, oh my goodness, they really don't. They really don't. And some people will say, well, what else can we do? I honestly think that sometimes behavior will improve if we take these things out and use other kinds of things. Um, but we have to be so careful because it really is about children believing that no matter what, we will take care of them. They shouldn't have to work for our, our attachment. They shouldn't have to try and do things that they're not quite ready to do. You know, if they, if, if they just, if they can't control their impulses, we shouldn't ask them to do that. And because when they are working for attachment, they're not resting. They're trying too hard to please us. And when they're trying to please us, they're not being who they are. And as I say, I worry more for the children who are the pleasers. I have two children. My daughter was more of a frustration little girl. She had more tantrums. Her emotions were out there. My son tried really hard to be the good little guy. And you know what? It was hard on him when he got older because he couldn't be good all the time. So we have to be so careful that our practices don't actually undo what's in our heart for our children. And I love this picture here because many of you have seen this or, or, or will see it over and over again because uh, this, there's a series of pictures here with, with grandfather. Uh, this little guy is not too happy with his grandpapa because grandfather had been away and uh, grandfather is being very kind and gracious to him and he's still not happy with his grandfather. But the message is provide more kindness and caring when behavior is at its worst because when we don't feel good inside, we need to believe somebody will take care of all of us, even the messiness. Now, how we do that with certain children, we're going to talk about. But we, the, the, one of the statements that I, I, I really wish we would never, never, never say anymore. But if I'm nice to him when he's being you know, inappropriate, aren't I reinforcing, am I not reinforcing his bad behavior? As Lena says, let's just think about what we would like our spouse to do. If I was grumpy in the morning and um, my, my spouse takes one look at me and goes, oh boy, she's PMSing, she's going to have a bad day today. And I get home and I say to him, I've had a really lousy day today. If my husband were to say to me, well, that's really inappropriate and you know you acted inappropriately all day, you need to go to your room and think about it, we would not be married. Luckily, I have a lovely spouse who noticed, okay, she's going to have a rough day today. I'm going to put a pizza in the oven. I'm going to boil the water for tea. And the minute I walk through the door with my grumpy face on and complaining about everybody else, he says, oh, you've had such a hard day, honey. Here, I made supper tonight. And why don't you have a cup of tea? And you know what? All of a sudden, I would probably burst into tears because his kindness has spoken to my heart. And of course, because I have a prefrontal cortex, I can say to him, uh oh, was I PMSing this morning? Was I in a bad mood? Oh, my goodness. But his kindness is what melted me. And that's what we need to do with our children. We need to really let them know in every way that we can, I'm going to take care of you. And when we listen with our hearts, 
we really ex respect that emotional experience of children. And then we enter into a true attachment relationship. And here we have Lena again, caring for the little one. Yeah, I'm one slide behind you here. Sorry, Eva. Yeah. Um, yeah, some things come to mind for me. Um, when I was reading Hold On to Your Kids, Dr. Neufeld's book, um, there was a set of three phrases that he said, this is what parents need, this is what children need from adults. Right relationship, discipline that does not divide, and boundaries that account for the natural immaturity of a young child. I thought, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I intuitively feel. I didn't know what right relationship meant or an attached relationship, but now I do. And I put this slide in because you can see that I am in the left picture providing, right? I'm reaching down, I'm providing for this child. And then he is following me. We're actually doing a morning verse. <laughs> But the gesture is, I didn't come in and say, I'm going to provide for you today. That was in my heart. But I was doing a morning verse. Good morning, dear earth. Good morning, dear sun. And good morning, dear earth. I've got my hands down. There's, there's me being the provider. And then he follows me. And this is to be worthy of their following is always in my heart. To be worthy of their imitation and to be a leader um, that's worthy of, of that role with them. And for that reason, I found um, tremendous help and support in this paradigm. Because to go back to Eva's um, discipline slide um, mentally, um, it, what what we do when we separate out behavior from the whole child can, can have those um, um, ill you know, not intended, but, but consequences to the child emotionally feeling that they are unworthy or unlovable. When we look at the whole child um, and understand that they don't have impulse control, they are inconsiderate, they're afraid of, of separation and brings out emotions of alarm and, and frustration and pursuit, then we can be kind. You know, it's just like, it's so much clearer to have that whole picture of what might be going on in the emotional life of a child. Nobody can do this all the time. Nobody's expected to, we do our best. We hold on to what we can. And uh, that, that has been very, it, it's always felt to me that the work of Dr. Neufeld has given me a foundation to stand on that I absolutely can rely on. And then my experience in, in trying to implement theory and make it into practice has, has helped. Uh, my practice, my classroom, the children in my care tremendously. So I'm, I'm very grateful. So final thoughts. Again, there's no perfect answer, but you know, we just remember we should be singing and dancing and having emotions and being playful and providing comfort and being as generous as we can, forgiving easily, forgiving the children and forgiving ourselves, forgiving each other feeling our sadness about all the things that we would love to be able to do that but that we can't um, and allowing children to feel their sadness having this faith in nature's plan uh, and just remembering that all development be be begins with attachment and everything that we do for a child lets a child know we will be taking care of them so we pulled together a few thoughts um, from this session um, young children are not like us and we are not like them one thought or emotion at a time. Treat incidents as accidents. Remember they're not behaving badly on purpose. <laughs> 
You know, it's that prefrontal cortex that just isn't there yet to help them be the answer. Create the conditions for growth. Don't combat emotion with reason, not too much talking. Compensate for what's missing in them and assume responsibility for a caring relationship. Um, and so I think at this point I will uh, stop the sharing. We do have some questions for a reflection, but we thought we would just give Cheryl a few moments to, to share. And then if you have, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I should put the um, maybe I should put the questions for reflection up. People can look at them perhaps. Um, just maybe even if you want to share in the chat, um, just some of the things that, that uh, might have struck you today. And Cheryl, I will let these questions guide you as well. I don't know if you, if you have some thoughts about what we were saying today, something that struck you or, yeah. Well, there's um, a lot of beautiful things you both have said today. <laughs> and uh, lifelong learning, I'm still learning. Um, but one of the things that struck out for me, one of the many things, you know, when you talked about treating the incident as an accident to help them out instead of uh, correcting them, you know, the, the sportscaster mode where you, you know, reiterate everything that uh, they've been through and just kind of telling them what happened, what was real. And I think at this point, you know, like, it's so important to respect their emotions to give them that permission to experience those emotions. And I feel that, you know, we need to do more of this. And when I think about it, you know, I talked earlier about, you know, a child senses your feeling. And in our language, you know, when we tell a child in the Anishinaabe language, we tell a child, don't cry. You know, it's a very direct language. And if I was my father, it would come across like this. And if it was my mom, my mom would say, oh, <laughs> you know, so you really got to pay attention to how you're, you know, you're delivering that, that concern. And uh, this is one of the things that that's different, I guess, for the languages that the, the First Nations speak. It's, uh, you know, it's the tones, the intonation, how you deliver this and how you were raised is also a factor in, on how you comfort children. But, you know, just try to make sure that you're respectful of their emotions and that you allow them to feel what they need to feel. And what was so important that I loved what you said is, you know, like, help them feel comfortable and name the feeling and put those words of their emotional experience, you know, into words. And I also liked, you know, when you spoke of um, the educator practices waiting, you know, like I love that picture where the child is waiting um, to climb the bridge, you know, and the other child is going to meet the other child and you know, it's something's going to happen, but you really don't know what, but they're in a safe protected environment and I'm right there you know this is perfect this is perfect for you know teaching for learning and I think we need more of this and the educator you know needs to their full attention has got to be there you know if I was on my cell phone <laughs> I'm texting my friend and I'm letting the kids play you know like I'm virtually not there yeah and um you know, like um, to accept that the biting and crying is normal. And, and this is our job as uh, caregivers to make sure that we understand the development of where the child is at, to be able to help them out, to, to help them grow, to help them learn. And you spoke about, uh, you know, this is part of being the normal part of the child's impulsive behavior. And a question popped into my head, you know, like, uh, the impulsivity, like when does this calm down and what age do they start knowing when we talk in terms of the brain? When does that impulsivity start to subside? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to answer your question? Okay. <laughs> um, theoret if everything is going well between five to seven years old and again, when we say between five to seven, because of course children develop, as you know, develop at different 
uh, different ways. Um, some children have very, very intense emotions, and that will kind of stop that prefrontal cortex from developing. So it's more towards seven or eight. That's if that's for children who are developing well. And again, um, of course, you in your in your child care centers won't often see that because by the time the child gets to that stage, they're over in the kindergarten next door at the school. Um, but some of you will have seen that in, even in your own children, a beautiful examples of, of children, you know, little children saying, oh, I wanted to hit her, but I didn't. But that's not till five to seven years old. Now, if a child has experienced a lot of difficult things in their life, a lot of separations. Uh, and again, many of you know the stories of the children in your care. So you know whose parents might have been sick or whose parents might have been had to go away or, you know, all of these, the, the, the tragedies that can happen, um, you know, deaths and early deaths and whatever. For those children, often that, that tempering element, that, that ability to manage their impulses will, will not kick in until they're 12, 13, 14 years old. Wow. Okay, because that prefrontal cortex is kind of like the brain, the body and the brain says, I got to take I got to survive before I can grow myself. It's like, it's, you know, it's like the plants that are, you know, being that that where that where the conditions aren't good, and they stay little. And so that's what happens. So with some of these children, we, children, we have to be very, very patient because they've just had too many things go wrong in their life so that that doesn't happen. But for most kids, it will come. But unfortunately, it probably won't happen very much in bits of it will happen. But, you know, it's part of our job. Live yeah, with it. <laughs> this is what makes the early childhood an expert, you know. And this is where I tell people, you know, we're not babysitters. We are early childhood caregivers. And this is a role as an early childhood caregiver or a teacher where you need to help children not only teach them, uh, you know, from their ABCs, but what is right, what is wrong, you know, how to feel. Yeah. And these things are, are takes time, you know, and it, it takes a, a generosity within you to to show a, you know, a child that they can, you need to provide that comfort zone where they can feel that comfort and be able to express this emotion. And one of the things that, you know, somebody had told me a long time ago is, you know, once you, you find that thing in the child and, you know, that, that one thing that makes them who they are, it might, you know, some of it's good, some of it is bad. But once you accept this, and this is when, you know, your heart is listening. Yeah. And doors start to open. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, um, I'll tell you one last story there, but I was with my niece and she was just a little girl and I bought her a balloon and it was, you know, like Barney, I love you, you love me. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize, you know, that her, her grandmother died um, about a few months back. So she was so happy with that balloon. She was walking, you know, down the street with her little balloon and whoops, she let it go. <laughs> and there was a huge, uh, high emotional situation that happened right there, you know. And I said, you know, I'm thinking in my head, why are you crying? It's just a balloon, you know. Mm -hmm. And she looked up to heaven, <laughs> heaven, <laughs> because she was brought up, you know, the she says, Barney is dead. Oh. He's gone to heaven with my grandma. Oh, yeah. So that was the real reason for the tears. Yes. And that's very often what we need to remember. They might be crying about the little, the little thing that happened on their finger when actually it was a much bigger thing that's making them feel sad. Yeah. yeah and, and to be able to help her express her emotion, you know, you must have been very sad when your grandmother, I did you cry like this, you know, and, and she was very, um, she felt very comforted in, in me accepting the fact that she cried over a balloon. Yeah. But it wasn't really over a balloon. It was about losing her grandma. Yeah. 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 And, you know, when we listen with our heart, there's so much more that we can do with children. And I appreciate you guys, you know, being here today and delivering this conference to all of us. And, you know, it's very, very useful information, I'm sure. And uh, 
I'd like to say you're doing a very good job and thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank, thank you, you for all the participants uh, listening. I'm sure that people have learned a lot today and um, I'm grateful that we have uh, all these participants and thanks to Valerie and CAPN for, uh, you know, having uh, started this and it's a great job that they're doing and CSSPNQL or FNQL will be in the support of this and uh, this it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I really appreciate that you're part of it. And you're, again, your stories are so relevant, you know, because you are the eyes and the heart of your community and you represent really well the, the family and every adult as well as the children. So thank you so much. And uh, as you said, she, she, we're thanking you to be there. And I think we've said it a few times, but your comments, your opinion is really, really important. So I know sometimes we don't really want to speak, <laughs> to speak while we're doing the workshop, but I wrote, there is a little form there that I put in the chat box so you can click on it. And then you give your comment and then it's really confidential, but it's, it's, there's no bad answers. It's only for us to be better and for you to have the opportunity to tell you what you would like to hear from us and how you would like it. So it's a start. It's a, it's a journey. We did the four to eight, um, four to eight years old. We have over 12 sessions that we did. And uh, we're doing those eight sessions. We'll be looking for uh, doing something with um, specialists, I would say, and also parents. So it's we're, we're on it. And it, but it's not for us, but it's for you, obviously. So your comments is really, really important. And now there is time for you to ask questions or any comments so you can it's time to turn your camera on if you'd okay. like to Let and me just join make sure people group. can if yeah. they'd like to and yeah. then if they gonna... would if you want to ask questions or challenge eva <laughs> 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 or <laughs> doesn't really matter but just be part of it we have like more than 10 minutes to go and yeah. it's all yours I'll be just just so we just because I know sometimes it's getting close to the time when people do need to go and attend to other things. Uh, we are having an online Q and A session on January the twenty fifth at six thirty uh, to seven thirty. Um, and uh, please, um, if you can come uh, with your questions, or you can maybe if uh, a number a, a number of you are from one center and you have some questions, you can um, uh, send send your questions with one person. Um, we haven't quite figured out the recording of that um, I you know because I think if there's a really good question but maybe what we'll do is we'll collect the questions and then at another date maybe we'll just record short answers to specific questions because that might be you know at least we know what people are interested in on the evening of Q&A it's about more much more uh, casual um, so but maybe when with certain kinds of questions it would be good to record those answers as well so do come and join us um, there is a whole list you should have the list of when those Q&As are there in English um, so do join us and if there's anybody that has a question right now we'd be happy to uh, just raise your hand or type it into the chat Melanie did you have a question or a comment or reflection Uh, no, I, I, I don't. But, uh, you know, I, I think exactly the same thing, Cheryl. It's, you know, it's amazing what you guys are doing. And, you know, we're hearing all these nice, you know, uh, tips. And I really hope that it's going to get to the kids, you know, because at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want them to be happy and they're the future. So. <laughs> yes. So we do have a question. I, um, I will read it out here. What are some specific examples of discipline that does not divide, especially for more challenging behaviors? For example, a child who hits others often. Would you like me to speak to that, Eva? Yes. <laughs> if you, it's up to you. 
but yes. It's it, a it, very it, it, good question. And we're going to be doing a session on discipline. Um, I can't remember right now which, which session number it is, but it's on your handouts. Um, well, you know, taking responsibility, um, I gave the examples of, of Michael with biting. Hitting is a bit more um, unpredictable. And what we have, what I have done, and what I believe is in keeping with the, with the paradigm is if I notice a child, what are the circumstances when they hit? And if I know it, it happens when there are too many people interfering with what he or she is doing or a particular person or something like that, then we will watch that situation and we will sit nearby or we'll take somebody out of the group and say, here, let's set the table. They don't really notice that as, as discipline and they don't notice it as a, as a separation. It's coming with an adult and doing something else. So they're removed from the situation. Um, thinking through how you manage those situations in your classroom is really very particular to the situ you know, to, to your circumstance and your children. But that's the type of thing that you would do. You would either move in closely um, and, and you would remove certain actors and have them do something else when you notice that it's always under these circumstances there that when there are three children together and they're doing something it often doesn't work well for this child and there could be a hit we also normalize hitting it's never a nice thing but um it's it, it's part of the age dr newfeld calls this the most violent stage of life because there's no impulse control or little impulse control. <laughs> um, and the intention can be, the intentions are to not hit, they care about each other, they truly do. So we normalize by saying, oh, you, again, the sports caster, you wanted that toy and so-and-so is playing with that toy. This isn't working for you. You have lots of hits in you today. This was frustrating. Something along these lines, naming what's happening, and then saying, your frustration needs to come out. Let me help you with that. Taking them away, finding if often things that are coveted in a classroom will have multiples of so that they can have their own. Um, but the hitting impulse, and Eva, you may have something to add to this, is coming out of that place of self-centeredness. And what they want is what they want. This is exactly what we're talking about. And so we name it, we normalize the fact that they're frustrated, something's not working to them, but we say your hits need to come out, but that's not the way. And then we find something else for them to do. or Sometimes you can give them something else to hit. I found my experience is that that's very seldom satisfying for a child because it was an impulse in the moment. In the moment. Yeah. And when we talk about discipline that does not divide, what we're, what we're talking about here is that we're giving the message to the child that even though you did this, I'm on your side. I'm going to help you with it. Not I'm going to let you do what you want. That's that's not the point. But but the trouble is that very often we're then that's why we we came back on don't try and correct it. Don't try and fix it. Manage it, right? And when we're managing it, when we're staying like oh no and let me do this and let me show you another way and oh you didn't want to hit him. Oh, I'm sorry that happened and you know that was frustrating. All those kinds of ways are just basically saying to the child I get it got too much and then we deal with it. We just deal with it. And we don't worry about teaching a lesson until a much later. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Carol. Bye. Thanks oh, for coming I like out. to see faces. I like yeah. to see faces. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, hi. There. Great. Lori. Hi, Lori. Bye-bye. Yep. Have a nice evening. Bye.
I have to come back in and say, hi, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> He's from KZ.